Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first of three online seminars on tissue engineering and regenerative medicine in space. Uh, these seminars are hosted by the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, or CASIS, uh, which is the manager of the ISS National Lab. My name is Rachel Clemens, Commercial Innovation Manager at CASIS, and I am excited to be moderating this first session, uh, which will be focusing on biofabrication. During the seminar series, we'll review research activities from the past couple years and discuss the future of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine research. The series will also discuss specific areas of research and new capabilities that enable life sciences research and in-space production on the ISS. Behind the scenes here at CASIS, there's a whole team of people who've worked hard to bring this series to you today. And I wanna make sure that I take a moment to thank them for all of their hard work. We were planning to hold a workshop about this time in Seattle this year, but due to the COVID pandemic, we, like many others, have elected to shift to an online platform. I encourage you to visit our website and see other virtual events taking place over the next couple months uh, in place of that conference. Uh, this session is also being recorded so that anyone who was not able to make it today uh, will be able to watch uh, this session at a later date. Uh, the recording, recording should be available on our webpage in about a couple weeks. So as I mentioned before, we're here to uh, talk about biofabrication in space. Um, additive biomanufacturing and 3D bioprinting are relatively new fields that have been advancing rapidly in recent years as new technologies are being developed. Um, in the following presentations, uh, you will hear about ongoing efforts to conduct this type of research on the ISS and how this research... Oh, am I on mute? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, in the following presentations, uh, you're gonna hear about ongoing efforts to conduct this type of research on the ISS and how this research in microgravity might help solve terrestrial challenges uh, of this technology for clinically relevant applications. Uh, each of our speakers uh, will have 20 minutes to deliver their talks. After the talks, uh, we will then have a 20 minute panel session. And at any time uh, during the seminar, you are free to ask questions using the chat feature of this platform. Um, our moderators uh, will collect all of your questions and pose them to the speakers uh, during the panel. So we look forward to your participation. Um, just as a reminder, um, please, uh, uh, if you're not speaking, uh, keep yourself on mute and your camera off uh, so that we can uh, make sure that the speakers can be heard. Um, but I wanna thank everybody for joining us today and without further ado, I'd like to start with our first speaker. Um, we're gonna start off with uh, Ricky Solorzano, co-founder and CEO of Alivi. Founded in 2014, Alivi creates tools and solutions to design, engineer, and build with life. Uh, Ricky's gonna talk to us today about plans for a new plug and play bioprinting extruder on the ISS. So with that, Ricky, do you wanna take the wheel? Sure thing. Hey, Rachel. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. As Rachel said, I'm, well, I'm very excited to be here. It's always great to be part of the uh, space community. I think it's a very exciting community, one that thinks about making things that were previously impossible possible. And hope I hope today to explain a, a, a little bit about a levy, but also as well about how as a terrestrial company, we think about entering into space and how we think about um, providing value, not only um, for the space station, but our, to our users on the ground. So let's see if I can control this here. Let's see, um, there we go. So, we started a levy back in 2014 with this idea to make it easier to design and engineer 3D tissues, especially 3D biology. And we did so by thinking about empowering our users, really allowing them to be able to um, 
printing pattern cells in 3D to solve some of the biggest challenges, whether it's novel drugs or novel medical devices. And we really believe that bioprinting is, is poised to change the way we do medicine. And so what is a bioprinter? Um, just as the basics. So a 3D bioprinter is basically a 3D printer, except instead of printing plastic, it prints um, bio inks and cells or biomaterials and cells. And bio inks really are just materials that cells um, can thrive in, that they can consider that they're in an environment like the body. And a lot of what we say a lot of times is being able to print the body outside the body. So why is it, why is it valuable? Um, well, bioprinting really allows uh, the ability to, to get cells into patterns. And so our entire bodies have patterns everywhere. And so traditionally speaking, as in the top left, instead of studying cells in a random orientation, you're able to use bioprinters to begin to align them in whether lines or, or circles or dots and significant geometries it's per se in the top right. And that has tremendous value in terms of uh, having greater physiological relevance or having the cells perform more accurately in the dish. And so um, what we can also see is that um, we can also see that bioprinters can take materials that were first considered to be um, that were just random slabs and instead of handing having them as, as kind of just a gel they can take these materials of interest and begin to pattern them in relevant physiological shapes like a like a heart valve, a tricuspid valve, a knee, or, and these are more macro-based geometries, but this has potential to think about custom-based implants, and it's a really, really exciting future for us as we think about uh, being able to create novel medical devices. So what is a levy? Um, a levy, well, we make uh, an experience for users to be able to design and engineer 3D tissue and it starts with the hardware um, and then it goes on into the wetware or the consumables so um, and last it, it has the we also provide the software and so I'm going to try to do something here let me see if it allows me to do it I'm going to share a small video a little bit about um, kind of some of the things that that we designed So we, um, we really build our, our systems to be very powerful, but yet very easy to use. And it's really one of, our, one of the things that we're most proud of being able to offer to our community of users um, the access to bioprinting in a, in a very easy way, but still being able to achieve a tremendous amount of new science. The other thing that we provide is, is being able to, um, we've come a long way in terms of identifying what protocols and what materials are most important for specific types of tissues. So if some a, a researcher is, comes to us and says, oh, we're interested in a liver, or we're interested in kidney, or we're interested in, in lung, then we have a, a foundation, we have a basis to say, you know, these are some of the most interesting protocols and these are even some of the most interesting publications that we've seen for people to grow on the science and really be able to achieve uh, being able to get significant geometries with cells and have them perform in a relevant fashion or unique fashion uh, for that specific type of tissue. We've done a lot of work to partner with different companies and that's both on the general life science side but also on the bio ink side. Really there's the bio ink field is an incredible one in terms of how much innovation is being done there but being able to identify what are some of the best bio inks to to pair or to, or to provide for specific types of tissues. 
um, has been a lot of the work that we've done. And so doing that in tandem with some of the bio-ink companies and developing these easy to use uh, protocols or, or easy to use experiences, uh, something we're very proud of and that we provide as well. Um, last, I would say our software is, is something we're tremendously proud of. I think a big thing about getting bioprinting to, to become more accessible to everyone has been how do we standardize and how do we allow someone who doesn't really know a lot about bioprinting come um, to an experience and be able to have themselves walked through what are the important things to think about? What are the, the steps that someone needs to be able to consider to say, okay, you know, I want to be able to design. I first have to think about the design, then I have to think about the materials. And then so from beginning even to, to end, even after that, to think about the analysis, the software really provides that environment for someone to come who doesn't have a lot of knowledge about bioprinting and be able to successfully obtain a print and and achieve that novel science, which is which is always something that we're, we're very much uh, trying to empower people's success. So I had another video and, um, you know, I'll play it. It's, it's a short video, but also about our software. So it's um, so we've done. It's the software is a great tool. It's a great it's a great place. As I hope I hope the video shows, you know, it has the parameters. The most important things are presented, while the things that are more complex to bioprinting, we've we've masked, we've standardized, and we've made it this kind of very easy to use but very powerful experience. And last to finish off, we've we have a tremendous community. Um, that we pride ourselves in. Uh, we serve over 350 labs around the world. We've had, we've seen growing number of publications, 300% year over year, which just shows the science that we're doing is impactful, it's relevant. It's having, um, you know, we're working together with our users to understand what are some of the best applications, where's where some of the best science going. And so people do everything from brain to liver to heart to kidney and, and all kinds of, of user profiles. So very, very proud of our community. But today, um, I'd also like to focus on our one of our specific projects, um, very exciting project, is which we call the Zero-G project. And so it is, um, I think, something that you'll find in the space community it takes time, and it's definitely been an idea we've been working on for, for, for some time, but we're very excited as to where it's going. And I also want to speak a little bit about, you know, how as we, how we as a company, because I think some, one of the things you'll see today as well is that, you know, there's, there's different stages as to where companies are in their evolution in terms of getting to the space station. We're on the beginning end, and, and that's probably why uh, I think we're excited to be going first. But, you know, first off, why space? And we see it as, our ultimate goal as a company is being able to provide these these platforms, these um, basically these tools to be able to get users to do novel science, to be able, especially within bioprinting. And so, by adding in another capability on the space station that's unique, that that needs um, 
that fits a need within within the space industry, as well as having extra added value to our own users, is something that we think has has a lot of value for both the ISS as well as our own users. So we developed what's called the Elevi Zero G, and we did so um, with the thought that we would just make the extruder itself. And I'll get into that a little bit later as to why. <laughs> but um, first off, we had to think about funding. And so there's always a question as to, you know, how do I get into the space industry? How do I understand um, where do I begin? And it usually begins, there's lots of different players that always have to come together, but funding is definitely one of the key ones. And um, the way that we approached it and we strategized is we really had to bring together different sources, both government um, as well as uh, some investors. And so understanding, usually it begins with grants. And so understanding where are the grants going, what to um, the government agencies, what are, they, what are their calls of interest? And that usually winning one of those grants or, or being able to get noticed by a government agency is really a great place to begin because all of a sudden it, it pulls you out of the crowd. And, and so we were able to acquire you know, our first grant. And then from there, we began with that traction and we turned around and we went back to some investors, which the investment community within the space industry is growing in itself. Um, I think there's more and more interest in in investing in private companies who have unique directions within space. And so then pooling those together is really how we were able to come up with a, a, a sufficient amount of capital to consider pooling together this, this project and then beginning this as a, as a specific direction. I think on, on top of that, it also we also have to think about this as a business case. So we believe that this has enough relevant business value to us so that we can um, have it be sustainable in the long run. So it's not just about a you know, one-off single project. It's, it's, a, it's a standalone product that can add business value as well as value to our, our users and um, ultimately back to our investors as well. So the last piece is, was logistics. Um, I think another thing we've found within the space community has been it's it's a it's a high part like partnerships is almost essential being able to especially as a terrestrial based company so being able to create partners with um, whether it's the government agencies but also logistics and so how do we think about getting something that we've built on the ground you know, into space and and that's not expertise we had and so we ended up asking around and came to um, find a great part, partner or a great relationship with Made in Space. And so we've been working with them. Um, and the idea first began that we were thinking about sending our own printer to space and the logistics around that is, is very, very complicated. So when we found out Made in Space, the, the company that had the first 3D printed plastic, um, they, they were the first to, 3D print plastics on the space station, we, we found that we, instead of just sending entire printer, all we do is had to do was send the central piece of the printer, which is the extruder. And so by, by just being able to send that specific piece, we could bring down the cost. We could partner with Made in Space who, had a, who has a host of experience around the space industry and also be able to gain traction with the funding to make the project actually um, begin in momentum towards the direction of success. And so the design considerations that we went into thinking about is it had to be small, it had to be lightweight, easily accessible, um, but also thinking about what are the important parameters that we wanted to begin to add so that we could get out the uh, ability to print out biomaterials. And so I think an important distinction here is is we actually have to we've approached this in terms of it's it's an extruder that is just biomaterial based. So I think it, and it's and it's really the first step. Its offering is going to be for um, being able to test out biomaterials um, and not necessarily at, at cells because that adds a layer of complexity, a layer uh, another added 
environment that's needed to be included, but at the same time, it provides an easy to use, but yet powerful method to be able to experiment with biomaterials in space to achieve different relevant geometries. And so that's really the, um, that's the, that's the goal, because I think, what is the goal of all of this? And I think part of it is understanding what are the, uh, what are the constraints and what are the values of doing experiments within microgravity? And so microgravity is a very unique environment. It, it has, it brings about unique properties. And just as we've had to do within, with bioprinting here on the ground, which is at the beginning, we didn't understand what are all the constraints and values of being able to print and pattern cells. We've come a long way to understand that through scientific experimentation and repetition. In that same direction, we've had to, we, we believe that by providing this and going through experiments, what the, the community in general will be able to understand what are some of the constraints and what are some of the, what are some of the value adds. And in doing so, then we can find those unique applications. And that's really, I think, one of the ultimate goals of the ISS, which is how do we find those applications which are not just research, but product-based and really making, um, making an industry out of, out of this, this space environment. And so with that, um, you know, I'd like to conclude and, and thank you all for your attention. And I will um, pass it back to Rachel. Wonderful, thank you, Ricky. Uh, it was a great presentation. Again, a reminder: we're gonna we're collecting questions as they come in. Um, I'm excited to see some questions coming in, so so keep them coming, and then we will answer those questions during the panel session. Uh, so next, let's welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Nicole Wagner, who is currently the CEO and president of Lamb Division. Uh, the technology of Lambda Vision, which we'll hear more about in this talk, was developed from research Nicole uh, conducted while completing her PhD at University of Connecticut. Uh, today, she's, gonna t she's going to speak about uh, the performance and stability of protein-based artificial retina uh, that was manufactured in microgravity. So with that, Nicole. All right, so I think you guys should be seeing my screen right now. All right, so thank you very much, Rachel, for um, inviting me to this presentation today. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about Lamb Division at first, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the work that we're doing in a microgravity environment, along with our implementation partner, Space Tango. So just a little bit of history. Lamb Division was founded uh, to develop and manufacture a protein-based artificial retina to treat patients that are blinded by end-stage retinal degenerative diseases. Some of the ones that you're most common with are probably macular degeneration, retinitis, pigmentosa, um, and all of those diseases are devastating diseases which ultimately lead to blindness. And so our product is designed to help those patients at the end stage when the majority of their vision is lost. So I like to start all of my presentations off um, asking everyone to imagine being at the height of their career and being forced to give it all up because you can't see a computer screen. Now imagine having to ask your friends and family for a car ride because you have lost your license. Finally, imagine finding out that you're about to become a grandparent for the first time, only to know that you'll never be able to read your grandchild a book. Retinitis pigmentosa affects about 1.5 million people globally. It affects about 100,000 people in the United States, and it is designated as an orphan designation um, by the FDA. This disease affects your peripheral vision first, and over time that will start to narrow until a patient is completely blind. Age-related macular degeneration, it affects a much larger patient population, about 30 million people globally, um, about 10 million people in the United States, um, and this disease works in the opposite way of retinitis pigmentosa, affecting your central vision first. And over time, that'll eventually expand until a patient is completely blind. 
Now, there are some treatments available for these diseases, but most of these treatments only slow the progression. So a lot of people are familiar with anti-VEGF treatments. These are these injections into the back of the eye. Um, what you'll see here on the left-hand side of your screen is a picture of a normal person being able to see. Um, that's actually a picture of our founder there. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the current standard of care. Um, and you can tell that this is very low, digitalized, pixelated vision, barely enough to distinguish between light and dark. Um, and this is just not good enough. This technology um, has set a reimbursement precedent. Uh, it's currently being reimbursed at over $75,000 per eye for just the device alone. And so this is just not good enough resolution for, for the device. So what Lambda Vision Solution is, is we have a high resolution um, retinal press, uh, artificial retina that can be placed into the back of the eye through a simple surgery, something similar to a retinal detachment procedure, um, which is really important because it increases adoption potential by uh, retinal surgeons. Additionally, the implant is small, flexible, and is long-lasting, uh, long which is really important. Um, and our implant is intended to replace the function of the damaged rods and cones of the eyes, which is your light-sensing cells of the eye. So the implant itself makes use of the light-activated protein bacteria rhodopsin. Bacteria rhodopsin is a light-activated proton pump, where it will pump a proton from the intracellular surface of the protein to the extracellular surface of the protein. And it does that because it has an all-trans retinal chromophore, which is covalently linked to a lysine residue in the binding pocket. The protein itself also has incredible stability because it's arranged in this two-dimensional hexagonal lattice of trimers. Um, so this gives the protein a stability which exceeds uh, over 85 degrees Celsius, uh, making it a really great candidate for uh, device applications. It's that construct that you'll see on the bottom left that is integrated into our retinal implant uh, construct. So we actually use an ion permeable scaffold, a layer of a polycation, and then multiple layers of protein, polycation, proton, polycation, so that we can absorb a sufficient amount of light to generate an ion gradient that can stimulate the remaining neural circuitry of the retina. So what's happening in your eye? I hope everybody who's, who's watching this presentation has a nice healthy retina. And you're probably sitting in your office right now and what's happening is the light from your office or wherever you are is actually entering your eye. Um, and it's being converted into a signal that's being sent to the bipolar cells, the ganglion cells, and eventually to the optic nerve in the brain. People who have retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration, they lose those light sensing cells or your photoreceptor cells. These are your rods and cones. As those cells degenerate, your eyes become insensitive to light. So they can't capture light and convert it into a signal that can be sent to the brain. So what we do is we put our implant where those cells would normally exist. Now the protein will absorb light. In response to light, the pump protein is going to pump protons towards the bipolar and ganglion cells, which are picked up on receptors. And that's eventually what is going to send a signal to the optic nerve. So there are some competitors out there that are developing um, artificial retinas and retinal prosthetics. Um, but what you'll really notice here is that these are really engineering marvels. You have battery packs, wires, goggles. And with that added complexity comes a much more complex uh, surgery, which is uh, certainly a challenge for people who are going to be putting this into the back of the eye and it increases the risk. Additionally, because you have, these are electrically stimulated, you need external hardware. Um, because we are using a light-activated protein, we don't have to um, have any external hardware. And then most importantly, we're not limited by the number of electrodes on a chip. Rather, we're looking at molecular packing of protein molecules onto the scaffold, um, which allows us to get a much greater pixel density um, than the competing technologies. So to give you a sense of what that pixel density looks like, again, this is the first figure you saw where we see Bob Burge on the left. This is the current standard of care, which is about 60 um, pixels or about three uh, pixels per square millimeter. And now this is what you can see with Lambda Vision's artificial retina. We, now you can make out edge sensitivity, facial features. Um, all of the people who would receive this uh, will see in black and white, and that's primarily because your light sensing cells are responsible for the color vision. Um, and those are the cells that are damaged in these diseases. 
about so there also are um, a number of emerging technologies that are out there uh, i'm sure many of you are familiar or have heard of gene therapy optogenetic stem cells you know a challenge with a lot of these technologies is the ability to get a high enough um, number of or optical density of the protein rather to be able to generate a signal that can actually get a sufficient ion gradient to stimulate those cells. And so this image here is a picture of a rat with a fiber optic in their brain. And that rat has that fiber optic because that's the light um, that's actually stimulating those cells. Um, additionally, I didn't mention this in the beginning, but retinitis pigmentosa is controlled by over 100 different genes. So to make a gene therapy, it's very costly and very expensive to do that. Um, and it only targets a very, very, very small patient population. Our implant is intended to help the patient regardless of the gene type, which is a huge advantage there. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of work being done in stem cells. Um, I think stem cells are great for trying to rescue areas of the retina, but in terms of actually recreating that neural, circuit, neural circuitry, uh, it's very, very challenging. So how do we make these retinal implant constructs and how does that relate to our, our um, project with ISS National Labs and NASA? Um, so the way that we actually manufacture the artificial retinas is through a layer by layer process um, where we treat this iron permeable scaffold and then we do a series of dipping and washing steps um, to generate a multi-layer film, thin film. Um, and you can see that on the left-hand side here, where we have that ion permeable scaffold, a polycation, bacteriodopsin, polycation, bacteriodopsin, and we do this over 100 times. Um, and then you can see in the right-hand figure that it is layer dependent. So the number of layers that you add, you can actually absorb a greater uh, amount of light and generate a higher signal. Um, and so what we're really looking for is a consistently oriented thin film that will be able to generate a unidirectional ion gradient. Um, the way that we're currently manufacturing these, we actually manufacture these in larger sheets, then we punch them, package them, and then terminally sterilize them. So there are um, you know, some limitations to how we do this on Earth. And what you'll see here is a picture, actually these are taken from our lab. Um, so the way that we're doing this, we are subject to the effects of gravity. Where if subject to things like evaporation, um, sedimentation of pollutions, and all of that ultimately translates to a challenge in terms of implant homogeneity. And so any issue that we may have in layer one can be compounded as we build up these layers, um, which overall reduces the, the uh, homogeneity and ultimately stability of those thin films. Um, and then, you know, what it also causes a challenge is in terms of the quality assurance and the assays that are needed to look at the quality of those thin films. Um, and that can ultimately reduce our usable area for preclinical experiments and ultimately clinical trials. So how do we get started in space? Um, you know, it's a very, it's a question I'm asked a lot. Um, and, you know, if you would have asked me, you know, four or five years ago, if we would have been looking at manufacturing this on the International Space Station, I probably would have said no. Um, and it's not because I, I couldn't conceive of it. It's because I just didn't know how to get there. Um, what we did know is that we had a lot of challenges with this manufacturing. And, you know, we were in sort of the right place at the right time. Uh, we were part of Mass Challenge in 2016. Uh, where we received, the, at that time, it was the Cases Boeing Sidecar Prize. Um, what was great is that at that time, we were paired with our implementation partner, Space Tango, um, which really helped us to see, you know, we knew what the challenges that we had on Earth with our implant were. What we didn't know was how to, how to do that in space. And that's really where Space Tango came along, um, and, as well as working closely with the ISS National Labs. So following 2016, um, we spent about a year thinking about and designing the experiment uh, that we were gonna fly um, to the ISS. Um, we actually flew our experiment on SpaceX 16 in December, 2018. Um, and then the experiment returned in January. We evaluated the protein and the thin films then. 
Um, so here's actually, there's three pictures here of what our, our cube lab looked like, um, the inside of the box, and then on the far right, you can actually see the protein flowing over the thin film. Um, what our hypothesis here is that we, were, we would get a much more uh, homogeneous, stable thin film that would increase the performance of the thin film. Um, we also know in terms of looking at this as a, just a design and experiment, um, the protein is incredibly stable. So it allowed for us to be able to send the protein to space um, and not really have to worry about any degradation. Um, you know, this whole process again was very efficient because it was automated. So we didn't, you know, we were limited in how much astronaut time that we needed, limited in the amount of resources that we needed from ISS. Um, you know, this was all very, very compact. Um, and also, you know, in terms of design, these implants are very, very small. So we can make quite a few thin films in, um, you know, a two to three cube lab, uh, which makes this also a very, you know, cost efficient um, as well as feasible in terms of the production vol volumes required for our um, clinical trials. Um, and, you know, just kind of touching on that again, as I mentioned, you know, our target is going to be the orphan indication of retinitis pigmentosa first. Um, because we are targeting uh, an orphan indication, you know, we're going to have a very small clinical trial. So this is a really great um, use case for us uh, to be able to do a very manageable production volume uh, as well. So this figure here is really just to, to talk a little bit about the protein stability. I mean, one of the things that almost would have been a totally, it's, it makes it a non-starter is if the protein really changed a lot in a microgravity environment. And what this figure here is showing is that pre-flight and post-flight protein um, maintain functional integrity, which was a really, really important thing for us. Um, and, you know, a really great outcome from that very first uh, SpaceX 16. Uh, Pathfinder flight. So some of the very the important learnings that we we got from that SpaceX 16 flight, layering was successfully demonstrated in microgravity. That was really important. We were able to deposit 100 layers onto certain areas of the substrate. Uh, I think in that very first image, what you saw is some bubbles. One of the things that we are doing now for our second flight is trying to reduce that bubble formation. And we've been working very closely with Space Tango and some people um, looking at fluid dynamics to change the design to remove those bubbles. Um, we didn't see any double layering, which was really, really important as well, um, because we did not want to have uh, coating on both sides of the thin film. And one thing we finally observed is that there was some cross-contamination of the solutions, um, but we have been working very diligently to, to um, solve that uh, over the past couple of months. Um, and we also were awarded a phase one SBIR, which helped to look at optimizing some of those parameters, and that phase one is listed below. So um, very recently, we awarded a NASA NRA, NRA award along with our implementation partner, Space Tango. The goals of this award are really to explore the benefits of microgravity for the development of our artificial retina. Uh, what we also want to do is evaluate and improve on-orbit manufacturing processes to produce artificial retinas that will be examined then on Earth. Um, and then, you know, I think what most people are, are excited about, too, is to establish good manufacturing practices um, and capabilities that are going to be necessary to produce any product that could be manufactured in microgravity that could have clinical benefit, which is, which is critical. So as we think about this, what's going to be really important is that GMP piece. Um, our goal is going to obviously to be to manufacture an implant that's going to be safe and effective. Um, as we're looking at establishing these GMP capabilities and working alongside with Space Tango, things such as reproducibility, consistency of manufacturing, as well as looking at that stability of the protein, as well as the stability of the um, artificial retinas, is it's going to be critical moving forward. And then alongside that, you know, some of the other considerations here are making sure that we have the appropriate assays, characterization, and documentation that are going to be needed. Um, and so we have, you know, we're at the very early stages of doing that right now. 
um, and are eager and on track to move forward to having th those appropriate discussions with, with the FDA um, and NASA and the ISS, you know, if and, if and when it's, it's necessary. So this is my, my final slide. You know, I think one of the really important pieces is beyond, you know, the artificial retina technology that LAM Division is focused on are really some of the other technologies that can really come from layer by layer manufacturing. Um, just looking at the protein bacteria adoption itself, I mentioned its stability. Um, as well as some of its, its light activated properties. It can also be used for photovoltaics. So one of the things that we're doing with our NASA Phase II SBIR award, which was recently awarded to us, um, is looking at some of these other technologies, both for bacteria adoption, applying it on different scaffolds. Um, and I think, you know, long term, you'll be able to see some additional opportunities coming out of this um, especially as we start to establish those processes and procedures and quality control systems that are necessary. Um, and, you know, I can see the future being things like drug delivery, biosensors, wound healing, um, and tissue engineering as well. So with that, uh, I thank you guys for, for your time. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Rachel again for the next presenter. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nicole. Um, it's it's, uh, it's really exciting to see all the all the work that you guys have been uh, getting done. Um, so uh, now we will move on to our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Jean Boland, uh, Chief Science Officer for TechShot. Uh, TechShot is one of the commercial implementation partners for the ISS National Lab. And Jean is going to present today uh, some preliminary results from recent work with the new biofabrication facility uh, that TechShot has installed on the ISS. And he's also going to speak about the future of this facility. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so, you know, TechShot has uh, you know, developed a biopreneur and incubation culturing system for the ISS. But, you know, listening to, you know, Ricky and Nicole's talk, I think it's important to look backward, to look forward. So, you know, we launched this, as the screen says, in, you know, July of 2019, but this project kicked off in June of 2015. So, you know, four years to get to station. And during that four years, uh, in June of 2016, uh, we flew our base printer on a parabolic flight to start to understand how bioinks behave in short-term microgravity. 2017, we flew our bioreactor with freshly printed materials to ISS to take a look to see, are we putting the right stresses? Can we feed them? Can we culture them? Um, our target has, uh, has now and has always been cardiac muscle and cardiac tissue. So it's important to add a mechanical stimulation, electrical stimulation, as well as feeding and waste removal. So that's where we kind of tested our baseline bioreactor to get some ideas. And then again, we flew on um, SpaceX 18. So, you know, 12 for the reactor, 18 finally for our full BFF, our bioprinter. And we've tested it now on 18, 19, and 20 and brought it home for some advancement. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later um, at the end of 20. But the reason for us doing this is not an experimental platform. Really, part of this is based on my own passion in the organ shortage. So I'd like to begin with really kind of looking at the reality of the organ shortage. And this is kind of helps where we kind of keep our eye on the ball that while 95% of Americans claim to support organ donation, only 60% of those people actually register as a donor. But the reality is even with that, only 0.3% of registered donors die in a way that their organs are donatable. So that equated to about 19,000 donors last year and 109,000 people currently on the waiting list, 68 of those considered active recipient capable transplants. And another nine people are added to that list every minute. And 20 people on that list every day die and others are deemed ineligible to remain on the list. So the catch in the bottom line is, you know, a patient has to be sick enough to be on a transplant list and well enough to remain on that list. 
And this list isn't getting any smaller. This list is continuing to grow as other attributes in our health system are extending life. We still have this problem of organ shortage and we're not gonna fix it just with donations. So that kind of drove me and drove TechShot um, through a little bit of pushing to say, what else can we do for looking at organ shortage? So for this talk, I'm gonna really kind of dive into the terms that we're using. As you can see with the uh, newness of uh, bioprinting, there's a lot of common language with different meanings, uh, similar to any technology field. So for us, you know, our bioprinter, when I speak of a bioprinter, it's the collection of dispensers, motion control, imaging system, and software to accurately reproduce a solid model with varying materials or bioinks. The TechShot Biofabrication Facility, or our BFF, uses four print heads to build the biological constructs and di dispensing through tips roughly twice the size of a human hair uh, to specifically put cellular and extracellular material where we need it to benefit that developing tissue. Um, I mentioned bioinks. Our bioink is comprised of all the necessary nutrients, proteins, and factors that cells need to both live through the printing process, because that's a little bit rough on a cell, as well as to promote sexual, successful maturation uh, given the external cues. In our experience, our cells that we've chosen are all um, either human-induced pluripotent stem cell or primary cells of vascular nature to push again to a cardiac and nerve and microvascular lineages. And then really where this culminates for us is in the bioreactor. Our bioreactor is designed to recapitulate the chemical, mechanical, electrical properties that a tissue would see in the womb during natural development, but to take that and accelerate it, you know, 10, 100, 500, 1000, whatever, times faster to form it into a functional tissue. And this is kind of where we go into a story that we like to tell um, as you look at between a bioprinting and a tissue, it's our, when is a pancake a pancake story? You know, the bioprinter and the bio ink, that's your pancake batter. And that's what you dispense. The construct you make is the same as pouring your pancake batter into the pan. Nobody really wants to eat that because it's not done yet. It's not done until you have the right griddle temperature and the right flipping and you keep an eye on it to make that golden brown pancake that we all want at the end. That's where the bioreactor jumps in is that, you know, constructs are cool, they look cool, but until you get through that bioreacting process, you really don't have a tissue. You have individual cells that are talking to each other. You have extracellular matrix that isn't really connected to each other. So an overview of what we looked at for our biofabrication facility is obviously our goal is to print 3D bioinks to culture them into functional tissues. Why microgravity? Well, you know, bioprinting is hard, so let's try to make it harder. Well, okay, that's not exactly the reason. The real reason is 3D structures are just more easy to produce in microgravity with the absence of convection, with the absence of buoyancy or sedimentation, so we can use a lower viscosity bioink and the cells and nutrients stay where you put them. This is really kind of a paradigm shift in bioprinting where we can print biology only for the sake of biology, not the sake of mechanics. So we don't have to add added cross-linkers. We don't have to add other structures to hold cavities open. We can actually print the 3D shape that we want. And speaking of printing 3D shapes, that's exactly what you can start to do in microgravity that you aren't doing on the ground is really move to three-dimensional printing instead of two and a half dimensional printing. And by two and a half, I mean the way that we typically have done it on the ground where you're printing layer by layer and building something up where it's you print X, Y, you step Z, print X, Y, step Z. What happens if you print X, Y, Z to X, Y, Z and move that coordinate? You know, can't do it on the ground, but you can do it in space. And that really opens up to a real three-dimensional printing to understand how three-dimensional tissues are made. BFF itself is an L-shaped triple locker. And what that means is it's about three feet wide, about two feet tall, and about two feet deep uses a gantry style printer. So X, Y, Z motion control is all held overhead onto the um, print, onto our um, smart pumps, and then print down onto a stationary platform. The electronics nitrogen express rack connections are on the right hand side, which I'll show you in the next picture here. And bioinks are contained in the syringes loaded on the front bracket, which means we can print four cell types at a time. We can print three cell types and add some other 
structural element, and those can be rapidly changed out during the printer process, so we're not limited to only three cell types or only four cell types, because as you know, most tissues in the body are made up of numerous cells in numerous locations and different cell types. And to recapitulate an organ or a functional tissue, you really have to have all that option available to you. And then the culture system is going to be the top right in the image, and it's three independent incubator chambers for our specialized bioreactors based on our advanced space processor, uh, which is some legacy hardware that's uh, kind of left over back from uh, when we were supporting a uh, space shuttle in our earlier days. So this is what BFF looks like. Um, again, uh, left-hand side is the print chamber. That's uh, roughly a 18-inch um, wide by two foot tall uh, and can print uh, nominally um, in a, um, our bioreactor gives it really about a three inch by three inch by two inch space, which doesn't seem like a lot until you're bioprinting and realize that that's a huge volume for bioprinting. And then our ad step on the top right and the electronics on the bottom left. Jumping inside the printer, this is kind of where the magic happens. It's you can see on the left image, we have the four color coded smart patents. Each one of those will have its own uh, syringe attached to it to dispense. And down below that is the dock. On the right hand view, that dock is populated with our bioreactor, and two of the pumps are loaded uh, with syringe holders. Looking at our initial bioreactor design, or actually right now our third generation bioreactor design, it has everything that you would anticipate for making a cardiac tissue. You have a feed and waste medium bag so you can pump in and control it uh, because we want a high automation on our system. We have a camera system to watch the evolving tissue and to watch how it's responding to stimulation, as well as a reactor that will control the chemical, the mechanical, and the electrical stimulation. So in there, we can provide plus or minus 20% strain on the tissue. We can provide uh, voltage spikes to go with that strain so we can start maturing tissues in the direction we want and start really understanding how those tissues are maturing and what capability we have in microgravity that we didn't necessarily have on the ground. So the efficiency of our bioinks, because we're going biology for the sake of biology, we kind of reinvented bioinks in-house, or not necessarily reinvented them, but kind of went back to, you know, just the base components and just to take a look at it. So the result is on the ground is our beating cardiac tissue test. So these are iPS cells that are pushed in our bioreactor to a cardiac lineage and then pushed to maturation. And you can see they start to beat they start to look like what everyone has seen before in cardiac tissue development. On the right-hand side, what we can see is two pictures of our decellularized matrix. Again, because we're printing the human heart and we're looking at a neonatal development, we're looking at neonative tissues. So we're looking, in this case, at umbilical cord and placental tissues that are decellularized, treated to remove any viral or bacterial components, and then they go through a process to take those tissues through lyophilization, through a cryomilling, and then through a resolubilization down to form an ink. These inks are then mixed, in this case, with a cardiac tissue ink that's processed the same way, and then a little bit added collagen just as a bulking agent um, to form what we're using as our primary inks. And these inks, again, have a viscosity that's too low to print directly on the ground. So what we learned, well, what we learned is about the same as you've always heard from, from Elon, is that space is hard. Uh, Real-time control that you have in the lab, when you add a six-second delay in a split communication system, is not the real-time control that you know when you do it on station. Um, simplifying systems to improve containment of materials can change biology. You know, through changing an orifice, changing a valve size, changing a seal, all these things will affect the biology since it's moving past it. And there's never enough time when working on the ISS. You know, this even in our early studies led us to look at higher speed motion control systems. So now BFF is built around linear motor systems with capable of driving at over 700 millimeters per second because speed is really the essence. And then we have to look at dispensing capabilities that can process at those kind of speeds because we don't want a long wait between the time that we start a tissue and the time that we finish a tissue. You know, speed, you know, speed kills in some aspects, but, but slow speed is actually, in our case, worse than a fast speed. And then we need to relearn fluid mechanics. Shapes matter most. 
when you get rid of buoyancy, when you get rid of sedimentation, when you get rid of all the gravity effects, now you really, really have to understand surface energy. You really have to understand your fluid mechanics of cohesion within the fluid itself because surface chemistry, surface factors, surface energy drive what's happening in your fluid. So now you need to change your materials, add shapes that both can pin materials and cause materials to flow because our bioreactor is printed empty. We print in an empty bioreactor and then we have to fill it with media. But air bubbles don't float to the top in space the way they float to the top everywhere else. So you have to understand how do you push the air out and push the media in and have that fill in a manner that your tissue doesn't end up with air gaps around it that will cause it to die. If, and also just to make sure that you have a system that can fill completely. And what we've learned uh, through our four flights now is keep trying. You know, this is an iterative process and this is where, you know, CASIS in the National Lab really comes in as a great partner in this process for us because it gives us the ability to keep trying, keep flying, keep working on it. Um, again, because we have the ability that we're an implementation partner ourselves, it gives us a little bit more flexibility to fly because I'm flying on my boss's dime and not flying on a NASA grant or not flying on a contract. Um, he doesn't always like that process, but that's kind of the way it works. And, uh, you know, we have this great ability to keep trying. And so kind of moving forward, we've decided there's some things that we could change. There's some things that can make this better for us. Uh, one of those things is an enhanced thermal control. If you notice, even in Ricky's talk, you know, he's talking about looking at thermal control at the pen level. It's something we didn't have in our original bioprinter that we're bringing into the printer for going back up because as you change materials, it really matters what temperature they're kept at during the printing process. No matter how fast your printing process goes, if you put them into a 37 degree chamber, they're going to reach 37 pretty quick through, even through conduction without convection. We're updating the bioreactor to take advantage of uh, the surface tension issues that I've spoken of before using surface tension as a restraint to add in strong cuts to add in pinning edges so that we can build more easily and not have a material flow off of a surface, not because of gravity, but because of shape and surface chemistry. Again, still working on improving our pumping and our filling systems. Um, again, that's an iterative process to say, how do we fill a bioreactor and void the air uh, as quick as possible? And then our current system is based on a white light system and we're adding UV cross-linking because we know as we open this up to commercial use and other partners that they may wanna use a cross-linkable ink that's currently available. They may wanna use the same ink that they're using on the ground. And we just are expanding our capability to meet the needs of our customers. Because when we fly back, I'm not gonna be the only customer. It's not gonna be the TechShot Science Team's project continuing forward. It's going to be the TechShot Science Project as well as open for business for anyone else that wants to print in our system, that wants to culture in our system and understand how their inks, their designs, their materials work in microgravity and really reduce that overhead cost. You know, Ricky's talking about earlier, how expensive it is to build your own printer. Well, this is kind of our approach to it, is that we can open this printer up to let other people use it, other people test it, other people bring more materials in because while my focus is gonna stay cardiac, there's a lot of organ shortages, there's a lot of other materials, there's a lot of ink development and bioprinting development that needs to happen. Um, so with that, you know, we're gonna be open for business after we return flight, uh, which is now looking like um, the NG-16 flight, uh, July of 2021 estimate. So we have about a year before we're back up and ready for business. Uh, and with that, I would just like to you know, thank everyone for participating. It's a great to see this number of people uh, for an online session and um, thank our teams at the left picture with our tech shop facility in Indiana and our right side with our lab down at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Thanks. And I'll pass it back to Rachel. Wonderful. Thank you, Jean. Yeah, I'm, I'm also excited to see everyone participating. And don't forget to, uh, for those of you who may have joined late, um, if you uh, have any questions, please pop them into the chat window and, and we will get to them during the panel session at the end. So our last speaker today is uh, Dr. Orchid Garcia, who's currently a research fellow and lead for bioprinting and tissue regenerative technologies at Johnson & Johnson. 
In this role, she is responsible for evaluation and execution of techno technical strategies and new technologies integration to develop a new class of next generation healthcare solutions. And today, Orchid is going to talk to us about how bioprinting is evolving, how we create and deliver personalized products and solutions to treat patients. So with that, Orchid. Thanks, Rachel. Let me get my uh, slides. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see okay. It looks great, thank you. Perfect. So thanks for the kind introduction and the invitation to um, address everyone today. I'm very excited to speak to this team in particular because I definitely see a lot of potential here um, for collaboration, not just on product-focused technologies, but on technologies that will accelerate product pipelines um, and provide some strategic and deep insights into how we innovate at Johnson & Johnson. So, as Rachel mentioned, um, I'm a research fellow at Johnson & Johnson. I lead the technology vertical lead for bioprinting and tissue regen technologies. Um, what folks may or may not know is that a few years ago, Johnson & Johnson made a strategic investment in 3D printing. Um, they made the investment in various different channels. So we have a metals channel, a polymer channel. Um, we have a scan to health and point of care, which is focused more on bringing this technology out of a manufacturing environment and into a healthcare facility. Um, we have sensors and obviously bioprinting. Um, the reason that this investment was made um, was the foresight on the part of, of folks at Johnson & Johnson to realize that technologies like 3D printing and bioprinting are going to become the norm in healthcare um, moving forward. So uh, this lives into our model of behaving like a 133-year-old startup. And so um, I'm excited today to show to share a little bit of why we made this investment in bioprinting specifically, um, what we're looking forward to, where we're focusing our efforts, um, and where we potentially see um, opportunities in the future. So um, one of the reasons that J and J made this investment. Um, in bioprinting in particular is there's, there's very various challenges that we're seeing um, in the current healthcare environment, especially now post COVID. Um, you know, prior to COVID, clearly there was a focus on outcomes, scrutiny on cost of care. Um, we're moving towards more patient specific care um, rather than the, the generalized medicine paradigm that we're used to. Um, we have aging, unique and vulnerable, vulnerable populations um, but on top of that, challenges like COVID, um, which are most top of mind at the moment, um, present new and interesting challenges that we feel that some of the technologies that we're investing in um, definitely have a role to play in, in um, helping live into this new healthcare paradigm, which may become a distanced healthcare paradigm. Um, so some of the strategic investments, as you may be aware, that j and is pursuing um, are in the areas of robotics and digital surgery, ultra-personalization, um, improved diagnostic tools, and predictive modeling. Now, I may be biased, but I feel that bioprinting is the nexus of where all of those technologies meet, and there's definitely um, a lot of opportunity to um, leverage bioprinting in all of these different channels, and I'll kind of walk you through what that looks like. So um, in terms of how we view bioprinting internally um, and how I describe it to my colleagues, because it, it is a bit of a mystery to folks. It is, a, you know, a bit of a nascent technology from the industrial perspective as well. Um, when you're looking at scale and supply at, at the levels that J&J &J operates at. Um, and so the best way that I like to describe it is it's the next step in evolution of ultra personalized medicine. Um, so, you know, clearly we've started out with intuition-based medicine. Patients come in with signs and symptoms. Um, a physician will uh, make an educated guess based on their experience, based on their education, um, as to how best to treat this patient. And there may be some trial and error, um, but that's typically the, you know, paradigm that we see um, in healthcare. Now, clearly we've moved into evidence-based medicine where, you know, treatment is based on large clinical data sets, which are generalized. And so 
um, you know, the ability to generalize those to a specific population, a specific age or disease state um, has kind of moved us into the precision medicine space where we're making decisions based on big data and algorithms. Um, moving one step further, we've got the personalized medicine space, which is what we see a lot of now, the genetic tests. Um, you know, you can see what your nutrition profile looks like or what you may, um, what genes you may be carrying, et cetera. Um, those predictions are based on the static patient genetic environmental lifestyle factors that are given um, as an input, a snapshot in time into, um, you know, uh, where a patient is at in their health journey. Now, with the evolution of ultra-personalized medicine, um, you know, bioprinting kind of fits really nicely in there because we can um, base treatments on dynamic individual patient needs um, and biological status at the moment of treatment, but also based on a lifetime of genetic and epigenetic um, changes and, and how those genes are expressed, et cetera. And so we can do things like take patient-specific cells, create an in vitro organ-on-chip construct, screen against various drug targets or potential therapies, and look at which makes the most sense for a patient. So what are the applications? Um, you know, I often get the question, about, you know, 3D bioprinting is great. However, how are you gonna ever get a, a product to market? Um, and in the interim, while a lot of regulatory agencies are refining um, guidance documents and, and putting that path to market in place, where can we generate value from um, this type of technology? And there's clearly two different buckets in my mind. Um, you know, one is, is I like to refer to as the product supportive technologies. So um, I lovingly refer to those as my innovation accelerators. And those are bioprinted constructs that will actually accelerate the pace of innovation or a pipeline of innovation um, for other products. So we can reduce reliance on animal testing, which can, you know, clearly be, um, you know, less than ideal models for what's ha what happens clinically in patients um, and can, um, you know, lead to um, a lot of delay in, in the availability of various treatments because you have this iterative cycle where um, you take a drug or a device into clinical trials and it doesn't necessarily perform as it had in an animal. Um, we can improve in vitro test methodologies um, to make them disease specific, patient specific, um, very often when some of our teams are looking into R&D, um, into new treatment modalities, it's difficult for them to order tissue or cadaveric specimens with a specific pathology. You get what you get. So, um, you know, sometimes they're flying blind in trying to telegraph how a technology will actually link up to the disease state in the end. Um, clearly improved in vivo modeling. So, um, the ability to plan surgery, the ability to print constructs that more accurately replicate what happened in vivo, um, and, and be able to more efficiently hone in on what some of those targets, um, some of those therapeutic targets might be. Um, on the other side, we have the transformational product technologies, very much um, similar to, um, you know, what we've heard today um, in regard to uh, some of the corneal constructs. And these are those product technologies that are going to transform medicine um, and create new treatment paradigms. So technologies that regenerate and repair rather than replace. Um, and, you know, very often in um, medical device design and in um, treatment for various diseases, we've been agnostic to regenerative medicine. And really bioprinting has the opportunity to take uh, that therapeutic challenge to the next level and create a space where we can not just treat a disease, but potentially regenerate some of that tissue, restore function, et cetera. So this is just a case study and I, I won't walk everybody through, um, you know, everything in painful detail. I know it's a bit of an eye chart, but um, you know, when, when trying to communicate the potential immediate impact of, of bioprinting to um, therapeutic uh, discovery, I like to use the in vitro tissue screening model. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of these. 
uh, recently. Um, I think there was an article in the New York Times most recently about the, the team at Wake Forest uh, looking at bioprinted tissue constructs for um, various um, COVID testing applications. You know, clearly the, the traditional paradigm is what we see on the top. Um, you know, pre-discovery when we're, we're screening large drug libraries, um, we're using static 2D culture models. Clearly there's a, a wealth of data that demonstrates that these types of models um, fail to replicate the etiology, pathology, disease progression, et cetera. Um, there are various architectural cues in a lot of the diseases that we look at, um, and, and those are clearly missing from a static two-dimensional culture where you don't have the appropriate polarization, architecture, et cetera. Um, bioprinting allows you to create that three-dimensional structure um, that will allow you to not only look at um, a cellular molecular level, but also the system as a whole and how that influences um, the um, initiation and progression of various diseases. So as we move into kind of, you know, pre-discovery to, to drug discovery and we're honing in on targets or we're honing in on devices that um, we're looking to, to move to, you know, preclinical and, and hopefully clinical trials, um, some of the monolayer and multilayer systems also, again, you know, fail to recapitulate what those cues are. Um, it's also difficult to um, incorporate things like microfluidics, which may be helpful for various transient biological cues um, that we may want to replicate. So, you know, very often in um, traditional drug discovery, you move through this cycle and you get into a, a preclinical animal model, um, which is great for recapitulating um, various mechanisms, but not the entirety of what's happening in the human system. And so, um, you know, animals are unique. Uh, mice have things like very long telomeres that allow them to regenerate in certain situations. And so the one-to-one -one correlation isn't always there. There's a lot of guesswork involved and, and, and the data set that you are looking to take into a clinical trial isn't always complete. And so many times what you've looked at in a Petri dish or in a, in a tissue culture plate um, may not play out in a preclinical animal model, and you may have to make multiple iterations to see, um, you know, to, to find a target, to find a device that actually um, addresses what you're trying to address. And even then, when you move into a clinical trial, you may have be faced with that iterative cycle again. So, um, you know, age, um, disease progression, um, various genetic factors, demographic factors, et cetera, may affect um, you know, how something that looked really good in the preclinical sense um, doesn't necessarily make it and meet that mark um, in the clinical trial phase. So all of this kind of creates a storm of an imperfect data package sometimes um, that we then, you know, go to regulators with. Um, and it may be difficult for them to telegraph how this may perform in a larger real world setting. So when you're not dealing with, um, you know, the physicians who are trained to the levels that they are in various clinical trials, et cetera. Um, and so that's why you, you kind of see this iterative cycle and you see this drawn out and folks get very frustrated because um, the availability of certain treatments isn't quite there or isn't, you know, isn't happening fast enough, but it's, it's because this process is an imperfect process and trying to capture and fill in all these gaps requires um, that iterative process. Now, I, I firmly believe that bioprinting has the opportunity to accelerate a lot of these processes, um, not completely replace, but, but as, act as an adjunct and even in some cases potentially replace. Um, so, you know, high throughput three-dimensional architecturally relevant models can be used for screening drug targets initially um, that will allow us to focus in on the most efficient, um, potentially, you know, um, best, um, you know, suited drug candidates to, to move through some of, of the later iterations of the discovery cycle. Um, you know, when we're looking at these models, we can then in vitro without using animal models, um, manipulate some of the parameters that we think may be relevant to the disease. Um, you know, various microfluidics, the addition of um, various cytokines or, or um, molecular moieties that, that we feel may be dysregulated in, in various disease states. Not only does this provide us a better model, 
um, it allows us to, to um, hone in on that very specific mechanism that we feel um, may be driving a certain disease state. Um, we may not be able to get that from cadaveric tissue. Um, additionally, for ethical concerns and other issues, you know, um, animal models um, are, are not the ideal. And so potentially we could replace those models with better models um, that are architecturally accurate, uh, et cetera, that, that give us better insight into how these drugs and devices might perform clinically. And then again, in clinical trials, if we have a better um, vantage point of uh, you know, how these um, devices and drugs may perform, we may better um, design our trials. So, you know, look at the appropriate populations, look at the appropriate disease um, progression, et cetera, and provide, you know, at the end of the day, the goal is to provide regulators um, better data sets, better foundational uh, models, et cetera, for their uh, approval so that they can feel confident in the drugs and devices that they're approving. Um, and we can bring those drugs and devices to folks um, a lot faster. So how are we at J&J &J, um, looking to incorporate bioprinting now and in the future um, to kind of change the trajectory of health for humanity, which has become our mantra? Um, you know, right now we're really focused on the disruptive innovation piece. So looking at pioneering these game-changing solutions that have the potential to accelerate various treatment paradigms through the R&D cycle, which is, you know, I, I just walked you through that one case study. So in particular, things like um, new materials, new processes, um, potential products, potential products, pr supportive technologies, or in vitro tissue models. Um, we're really not focused on the hardware piece of things. I, I, you know, I don't see us getting into the capital equipment game. Um, but it's those patient-focused solutions. How can we better treat patients? How can we bring new healthcare solutions to them? Um, how can we deliver our healthcare solutions to them better? Um, the next step in my mind, obviously, is the personalization piece, which I talked about earlier. So translating um, something that, that could be very generalized into something that's very specific to improve outcomes for specific patients, not even specific patient groups, but specific patients. So implants that are matched to the patient um, rather than an implant that's a general size and put in a patient. Um, specific, you know, in vitro screening and, and, and uh, planning, either surgical planning for dif difficult cases um, or, you know, uh, in the uh, the medical treatment side of uh, of the equation, and then finally the the access piece is something that we're looking forward to on the horizon. So as we're moving into a socially distanced society, we are going to have to anticipate um, you know distance medicine as well. Um, you know, in, initially the challenge was to bring some of these health healthcare solutions to folks who. Uh, don't necessarily have access to world-class facilities like many of us are lucky to have access to. Um, but now we're looking at how can this play into um, the, the new distance paradigm where patients and physicians may not want to have that face-to-face -face contact. Um, you may need to deliver healthcare solutions in home. So how do we deliver some of these healthcare solutions um, in a in a distance manner, is it point of care delivery? Um, you know, clearly there there are going to be you know um, there's going to be the need to set up infrastructures for on demand solutions, etc. So how are we doing this at Johnson and Johnson? So clearly we've set up an internal team of experts um, that have these competencies, have these skills, but we realize that you know if if we do all of this internally, we're essentially innovating in a vacuum. Um, you know, there are some freedoms that academia has versus industry when, um, you know, chasing some of these new um, mechanistic paradigms and some of these new product solutions. And so we've um, strategically, not just in my group, but also across the organization, um, set up various partnerships and are always looking for, for tremendous partners um, to be able to work with to understand the technology, develop it, steward it, um, et cetera. And so, you know, we have strategic partners. Um, you know, we've got various partners in industry and academia that we work with. Um, 
we've got technology partners, uh, various startups, et cetera, that um, you know, we're either working on targeted application or platform technologies with, and then clearly the hospitals and medical centers. So the folks at, um, you know, who are on the front lines who will be using these types of technologies and, um, you know, who, if, if these aren't designed properly, um, you know, will, will not have a use for them. So we've partnered across all of those channels my team and specifically my front end R&D lab is located in Dublin uh, because we have a wonderful partnership with the Amber Center in Ireland, which is a consortium of colleges and universities um, focused on materials development. So Trinity College is where we're based, but we have a collaboration with the Royal College of Surgeons, et cetera. Um, we also have a partnership which was announced earlier this year um, with TNR Biofab in Korea to create um, various platform technologies based on uh, some of their previous work and, and some of the internal work that we had previously done. So, um, you know, the, the partnership model that, that we've embodied um, to me is, is refreshing because this is where, you know, the, the nexus of all of these great minds come together and, and we can move some of these adma advancements forward faster. Um, now, the piece that we're missing is the research and space piece, which I think um, will probably be the, the lowest hanging fruit um, from my perspective, but, but being able to gain some of those strategic insights or some of those insights and, and leverage this technology to get there, I think will help us build a foundational data set for some of these later stage project product technologies that we're, we're looking forward to, uh, to bringing um, to medicine. So, what does the future hold for 3D bioprinting? Um, you know, clearly I'm biased, but I feel it's a key enabling technologies that can address a lot of these challenges that we talked about earlier and some of these new challenges that are coming up. Um, you know, clearly there's a scrutiny on cost of care. Um, when you're talking to hospital systems and hospitals, there's, you know, there, there are, are committees that will make, um, you know, treatment decisions um, based on cost and so, you know, being able to source um, biomaterials from consistent, reliable, scalable supply chains um, will eliminate the need for human sourcing and processing, which will bring down costs, also bring down a lot of uh, regulatory implications. Improved outcomes clearly is one that we discussed. So, you know, to be able to regenerate rather than repair, to restore function, um, not just mechanical, but biological function, um, and being able to consistently and reliably provide these predictable outcomes across patients is an important one for us as well. Um, finally, you know, a lot of these treatments that are regenerative, that are, are sourced based on um, various allograft and xenograft technology are limited based on donor supply and donor quality. And so um, we never want a patient to not have the option for the best available treatment because there's not a donor available. Agility and responsiveness clearly is a, a big one for us. So being able to use this technology to be to provide on-demand flexibility, um, tailoring all of these um, you know treatments specifically for patient needs, multimodal delivery is one that I'm probably um, most excited about. I think bioprinting lends itself quite nicely to um, different delivery paradigms. Uh, so, for example, you know, you can have bioprinting in a traditional manufacturing environment. However, um, point of care, so manufacturing within a healthcare facility or even in situ, so in the operating theater, um, I think this is where bioprinting will probably, um, you know, make the biggest strides in, in the near future is some of those technologies that bring um, you know, the, the, the larger technology of bioprinting into a patient care setting, um, I think will be um, most impactful. Targeted solutions, again, minimizing risk by ta tailoring um, treatment specific to various patients, expanded access, again, minimizing regulatory hurdles that may be encountered with other types of treatments, and then ultra-personalization, which um, we discussed earlier on. So um, one of the things I was asked to, to kind of reflect on are what are some of the gaps and challenges that we're facing um, and that I'm seeing on the industry side, and these may be very different 
um, from the academic side or from the research side, but you know, clearly there are gaps and challenges and standards um, for medical and biological additive manufacturing um, and the maturation piece. So, you know, bioprinted constructs are very different from a 3D printed metal or polymer construct in that you print a metal construct and you ship it to a location and you can trust that it will essentially be, um, and, unless something, you know, um, terrible has happened, it will essentially be the same construct that you printed. Now for bioprinting, that's not always the case. Um, you know, some of these technologies don't lend themselves very well um, to transport. So how do we um, guarantee the quality and integrity of not only what we printed in the lab, but what was matured over time and what was transported and delivered to a patient? Um, specific guidance document for 3D printed devices containing um, biological components. You know, the, there are some uh, regulatory agencies who are um, being very forward thinking and reaching out to us and having these discussions along with having discussions with academics about how best to develop these technologies and what we see on the event horizon and how they can adjust um, to suit those needs. And so, you know, those guidance documents are forthcoming, but for scientists like ourselves, it's, it's not fast enough. Um, fit for purpose regulatory framework for personalized devices and products. So for those one off, um, you know, printed on site, printed specific to a patient, printed specific to match an anatomy, um, you know, those regulatory frameworks are, are still lacking. I think that we've done a great job in being able to leverage um, what's currently available right now to, to kind of get closer to the fit for purpose piece. But I think there's definitely an opportunity to, um, you know, it, engage there and, and create a more robust mechanism. Again, a manufacturing framework, um, manufacturing and delivery framework, scale and supply capabilities for biologic and cellular components. So clearly, um, you know, cells are, are not able to be endlessly expanded. Um, you know, the biologic sourcing of materials to ensure quality, integrity, reproducibility, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there are some gaps data and intellectual property protection, you know, if we are making patient-specific constructs or if we do have um, patient-specific genetic and epigenetic data, how do we manage that? And again, on, on the, you know, opportunity side, clearly what I mentioned, you know, there is plenty of opportunities for regulators, academic, government agencies, um, industry to engage and work simultaneously um, to develop some of these frameworks. Um, I definitely think there's a huge opportunity to integrate, um, you know, the automation of AI, robotics, digital surgery, um, and not just for the creation, but scale, supply, delivery, et cetera. So again, you know, bioprinting is rapidly evolving. Um, you know, J&J &J has, has placed a strategic bet because they realize we're, we're headed in this direction. And, and um, you know, we think it's important to um, understand this technology, develop it, because clearly this is going to be what our patients are going to be demanding in the future and, and what healthcare needs in the future. So we're definitely looking forward to seeing um, the field progress, engaging with individuals like yourselves to see how we can make strides forward. And um, in closing, you know, again, our mantra is, is always to have the patients in our forefront and, and look to change the trajectory of health for humanity. And clearly, in my mind, bioprinting really suits that entire um, mantra. So I will stop there and I will hand it back to Rachel and look forward to questions during the discussion piece. Wonderful. Thank you, Orchid. And uh, thank you to all of the speakers um, for presenting for us today. Uh, we're going to transition now into the panel session and um, Thanks to uh, all the speakers for um, finishing under time. We have just a couple extra minutes um, to, to get some of these, some of your questions addressed. And, and I also have some of my questions, uh, some questions of my own that I'd like to ask. So um, first, I want to start with a question uh, for the group. Um, Just reading through some of these questions here. So, um, yeah, to, to all of you, uh, based on uh, based on what you currently know about biofabrication in space, 
Uh, what experiments would you like to see performed in space and what would advance the technology or the capability? So I think um, just to be organized here, why don't we go ahead and start with, uh, with Ricky? So uh, I think the, the way we're approaching it in at least in some of the initial experiments we're doing and what we're curious about is really just material characterization. I think the bioprinting community, that's how originally is, you know, largely started with material science scientists. So being able to enter and understand, you know, what are differences in viscosity that have an effect on in correlation with microgravity or what are some of the even photo cross-linking parameters that, that change within microgravity. And so being able to understand how microgravity is playing a role in terms of decreasing the availability of viscosity or changing the way a photopolymerization is happening, I think are some of the initial thoughts we have in terms of entering into this bioprinting realm, but really through the material science side. I think you're on mute, mate, Rachel. I can jump in. Um, you know, for us, you know, part of part of what I would like to see is really understanding that, you know, more of those um, kind of micro niches between uh, cells, both stem and differentiated cells, and the different materials. So, you know, there's a, a fairly long history in microgravity that stem cells behave differently. Um, to some extent, whether they're more proliferative, to some extent, whether they you know, de-differentiate or, or delayed differentiation. And now, you know, a lot of that work was either done on flat culture or more recently in spheroids. So I really want to kind of push that to the next step now with tools like bioprinting to say, hey, you know, now in a really actual 3D environment, how do stem cells really behave and really start to understand and unlock some of those uh, mechanochemical extracellular matrix interactions you know i'm a little biased being a uh, you know matrix biology guy myself that uh you know go matrix um but uh <laughs> really uh, try to see uh try to really kind of unlock some of that stuff even from a fundamental idea to you know how much differentiation is enough how much you know because we still need expansion since none of us are printing yet at 100 percent cell density so, you know, finding that balance is going to be really critical. And the only way we're going to do that is to fly more experiments, to do more testing, and to really look and start unlocking some of those reactions. Yeah, Rachel, I, I think you're still, you're either still on mute or you're having problems with your speaker. So I'll just open it up to um, Nicole, if you have anything else to add to, to that. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, um, you know, we're not necessarily trying to 3D print these cells, but we are creating a, a multi-layered structure, right? And so for us, you know, we're, we're, we're primarily interested in is a lot of the in-process controls. Um, you know, is there a way to evaluate these layers in between um, you know, in between runs, you know, what are some of the quality systems that can be put in place to look at um, individual layers? And then, you know, equally as important is a lot of the ground testing that we're going to need to be doing, um, evaluating pre and post flight um, implants that are generated. I think that uh, for us is going to be important moving forward to look at the impact of, of microgravity, both on the protein and then on the deposition. And then Orchid, um, listening to the talks today and your um, introduction to microgravity research, what are some of the things that you seem to um, that you're looking at that might move the needle for you at, at Johnson and Johnson? Yeah, I think I think in the near term, what interests me the most is the um, acceleration of various degenerative diseases um, or disease states that we see in microgravity. Um, you know, when you translate that into an industrial sense, um, when we're trying to study that from an industry perspective, that essentially means longer clinical trials for us to get some of those outcomes um, that you may see accelerated in microgravity. And so 
I'm excited to see the correlation between some of the unique behavior that we see in microgravity and clinical outcomes and, and see if we can use some of those insights and some of that foundational data as inputs into not only the clinical trial process, but as an adjunct to it so that we have the ability to study rare or um, you know difficult to study outcomes because um, they can be limited um, by either patient population or the ability to study patients for 20, 30, 40 years. Wonderful. Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Yep. Great. Hear you. Um, I I wanted to follow on uh, with that question. Um, uh, it's a question actually for Nicole and Jean, uh, since both of you have conducted some of your work in space, um, you know, thinking about the capabilities. Um, I think both of you have encountered uh, some, you know, microgravity presents a, a great opportunity to conduct uh, new research and, um, and make new discoveries, but I think both of you have encountered some challenges with working in microgravity, and I'm, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how um you know some things that surprised you i know gene you kind of talked a little bit about it um but maybe recommendations for the community for for people who are coming into the field um thinking about the fluid dynamics piece and um and how they might um uh think about those challenges ahead of time gene do you want to start sure thanks i can jump in um so you know really one of the big things for us is was really understanding all the effects of surface tension i mean everyone in the community always says you know surface tension surface tension surface tension but there's not a lot of us that have actually gone out with our inks and our materials and done the angle analysis to do the drop test to understand really exactly what you know what our surface energy interaction what ability of our surfaces really are and it matters it's we kind of you know, we've all kind of glossed over that step and we've moved like five steps down and saying, oh, wait, you know, what's the collagen concentration I need without realizing that 1% oh, of my collagen concentration changes my wetting angle, which changes my flow rate when it hits the material. And all these things are so interrelated. It's, it's enough to kind of, you know, you really have to develop better planning and you know, that's one of the advantages of the time it takes to go to space is that hopefully it allows better planning. The downside is, is there's so many variables, you can't test all of them ever because, uh, yeah, you'll, you would never fly. So really understanding all of those basics. And for us, it always comes back right now. It's always coming back to surface tension and understanding those surface tension material interactions and making sure that, you know, we're using the same materials that we're testing those materials that we're keeping the same polish that, you know, all of those materials just have to be identical or our, or our results change drastically. Yeah, I guess I would sort of add to that, you know, we, prior to Mass Challenge, I mean, we did everything terrestrially. So, you know, our biggest challenge was first, how do you even get to space, right? Um, and in thinking through that, it was thinking through our experimental designs in a very different way. The effects of miniaturization, you know, how we took what we were doing terrestrially and now making that for something that could be be flown in space. So you know just from the start we had to do a total redesign of the experiment um which meant we were dealing with different different variables changes in flow rate i mean we did a whole sbir grant on looking at parameterization changing things like how fast it flows over resonance time um recycling of fluids um how you know changing the chamber sizes and the chamber geometry and how that affects um the overall deposition um, and then, you know, that also comes into pay, play as a startup company and as a company looking to eventually scale, you know, what happens as you start to think about scaling this and how does, how, how do you scale that? Um, and, you know, does, does changing the size automatically start to change different, different things within how, how that protein is going to deposit on those film, thin films? So those are, you know, the obvious challenges. I mean, I think, you know, something Jean kind of mentioned is you can't test all of the variables, right? So, you know, our very first experiment, we, we did see some bubble formation. There were definitely, you know, some some things that we could improve on. 
but you know you you do kind of have to narrow it down and say you know what are the key variables that i want to test in this particular experiment and you know how can i and also really go through an experiment in, in experimental design and think about every variable and how you can control so that you can know what is the is the variable that's impacting um certain things that you that you're seeing um and then you know the other part of it is is a sort of a waiting game you know you you you're not flying every week um so it's it's trying to design experiments there's a lot that goes into it ahead of time um as you move forward yeah yeah um it certainly is a different uh a different experience for a lot of people um not the timelines that they're used to um Nicole, I want to I want to stick with you for a second and ask you about. Uh, you mentioned that there are some broader impacts of the work that you're doing um, with uh, <clears throat> the product development, the the, the retinal implant, um, particularly wound healing. I think you also mentioned um, drug discovery or drug testing, and I. I, I wondered if you uh, could expand on that um how are you um are is there is there knowledge sharing you're planning on engaging in um how um how do you plan on um, impacting those other areas sure i mean i think you know from the start you know lamb division is certainly focused on on developing the artificial retina technology um but what we really have you know built a lot of expertise on over the past you know, 10, 10 years has been on this layer by layer deposition um, and layer by layer deposition of the protein onto various scaffolds, at least if you're thinking specifically about bacteria adoption, has, you know, led itself to a number of different device architectures. You know, I spent my background and my PhD on optimizing the light activated protein for photovoltaics, holography, chemical sensors. Um, and it's because of that unique property of the protein to absorb light uh, translocate that proton that it can be used for those those different architectures. Additionally, I mean, I think one of the questions as well, not to get off, off target, was, you know, could we do color vision? A lot of what we've done as well has been optimizing the protein for these different architectures. And so we have proteins that can shift the lambda max of the protein, proteins with different tags on them. All of that lends itself into some of those other devices. Um, you know, as you start to think about wound healing, uh, you know, anything that you can coat a, a drug or something onto some type of a scaffold, I see there being a potential uh, in microgravity. Um, you know, where you need to strike a balance, of course, is going to be economics. You know, is it economically feasible? Can you do it on Earth? Um, or, you know, is there such an improvement in a microgravity environment that that it warrants you know the the extra time and, and work to do it in a microgravity environment um you know for what we're doing with a small patient population at least as an initial target i think that this is a, a great opportunity and i also see the potential for scale with with us um you know i see the same thing for some of these other technologies as well um but you know for the companies thinking about doing it those are kind of the exercises also that you kind of have to go through is What's the cost? What you know? What's the time that it's going to take uh, to do this? And is the improvement significant enough in a microgravity environment that it, it that you get a return on on that investment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. Um, and that brings me to a question for Orchid. Actually, um, Orchid, you're uh, you've you know. We've only recently started um, talking about, <clears throat> you know, applications for space, and um, you laid out really nicely uh, some of the the way that Johnson and Johnson is thinking about just bioprinting as um, as a way to uh, address some patient challenges. And I'm curious, um, you know, you <clears throat> you also said that space is a is a low hanging fruit, and I'm. I'm just curious um, when it comes to timelines though, um, how, where do you see space sort of helping to accelerate or, or do you yet? Or good, I think you're muted. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Perfect. 
Okay, so the 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 lower hanging fruit comment wasn't in relation to space as a whole, because clearly there there are challenges there um, that may be limiting to developing various technologies in space. In my mind, the lower hanging fruit is directed at there are some strategic experiments that I think that can be done as we progress towards utilizing space as a manufacturing environment. Um, you know, it, very similar to terrestrial development of this technology. If you go for the, um, you know, the ultimate application, you know, fully cellularized functional organs, et cetera, um, that's quite a long path and quite a, you know, quite far off. I do think that there's some foundational data and information um, and studies that can be done that will provide additional insight into um, various disease developmental processes that happen here on earth that can help us um, better tailor some of these uh, patient solutions that are based on bioprinting. So just clarification there, it wasn't space in general, but that along that paradigm, I think that there are some strategic applications that would be um, easier and faster to initiate. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you for that clarification. Um, so <clears throat> now I want to shift to um, Ricky, uh, Ricky, and also Nicole, actually. Um, Ricky, you're doing some forward thinking on uh, bioprinting in space. And I'm curious if you're planning on doing any uh, prep work in simulated microgravity uh, ahead of ahead of your in orbit testing. Yeah, I think um, the the natural logical step there is a is a is a zero gravity. Uh, it's a parabolic flight, which I think TechShot actually you know did a couple of years ago, and <clears throat> I think that's a very good way of gathering insight and you know we applied for some funding there and we'll see if it comes through um and so i think um it would be very helpful and i think we're we're preparing to to obtain it but uh again it's uh, it's dependent on the funding and so ironically i think we've been approved to fly <laughs> to the iss and i think it's it's great again this is all about combining different opportunities but you know saying hey we, we were approved to fly so going back and getting pre orbital flight is, is really something we're doing right now. Great, great. And uh, Nicole, um, in, in getting ready for uh, your SpaceX uh, 16 uh, flight opportunity and, and looking forward to, to future flight opportunities, are you planning on, on doing any simulated microgravity um, experiments? You know, we haven't done much um, on our end other than to really look at at the protein piece. You know, are we expecting any pelleting of the protein, um, any aggregation? Those are things that we, we've we tried to simulate a little bit. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, Space Tango has certainly worked in, in some modeling of, of chamber designs and geometries as well. Um, but in terms of actually physically doing any experiments, it's been more on, on are we worried about any pelleting of the protein? What is What could happen is, as we're doing takeoff? Um, those are some of the things that we've been considering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it looks like we only have a couple minutes left, um, but I did want to get in one, one question um, if you guys want to answer really quickly. We're um, right now, uh, CASIS is thinking a lot about the next three to five years um, and, and helping to accelerate product development. And I, I, I was curious if there are, you know, from your own uh, unique perspectives um, with bioprinting, additive biomanufacturing, uh, terrestrial in space, you know, what are some applications that you're looking forward to in the next, um, the next three to five years? Um, or could I'll start with you? Sure. And are you are you asking specifically in relation to bioprinting in space or just bioprinting in general? Just bioprinting in general. So, um, yeah, great question. I think one of the ones I'm most excited about is the in situ technologies that I'm seeing. So printing in an operating theater, being able to extract cells from a patient 
minimally manipulate them and then put them in targeted locations. Um, I think that's going to bring the technology into a patient care setting a lot faster than maybe some of the end stage manufactured constructs that, you know, have to go through quality systems and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I would say that's the, the one I'm looking forward to the most. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jean, what about you? Are you excited yeah. about the next three to five years? You know, I think part of what we're excited about in the next three to five years is combining the exploding MPS technology, the microphysiological systems, with bioprinting on orbit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's our like 10 year, 12 year goal to print a full functional organ, but it's our, you know, 18 month, two year goal to print a functional microphysiological organ. So really to see how these things reorganize, we can still use the same inks, we can use the same printing, we can use the same methods, just on a you know micro scale rather than a macro scale and really start to break it down now that those technologies are maturing and we're looking at you know where's the hybridization of technologies come from um you know microphysiological systems are really growing you know bioprinting is growing where can we merge them and then how do we use that to take advantage of microgravity and that's kind of um you know i really kind of see that for both you know drug screening and organ development disease monitoring as our three-year horizon Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, Nicole. Sure. You you know, for, for LAM division, you know, obviously our, our goal is to be able to help patients re regain vision, right? Um, and, you know, we're, our goal in the next several, three to five years is obviously to be in clinical trials um, and to, you know, start to see the beginning of, of you know, the efficacy of our, of our technology. So, you know, I think what's going to be exciting for us um, is going to be actually looking at the ISS as a platform for manufacturing the, the artificial retina um, and developing a lot of those processes and procedures that are going to be necessary to actually manufacture something that has clinical benefit on earth. Um, and you know, as a, as a goal in general, you know, I can see other technologies really starting to leverage some of those capabilities uh, moving forward. Uh, and so that's what I'm really excited to see over the next couple of years. Wonderful. And Ricky, why don't you take us home? Yeah, I think <clears throat> very excited in the next uh, three years or so on how bioprinting is going to play a larger role in terms of drug development. I think especially in terms of the high throughput screening areas. I think that um, there is the, the vision and, and the long-term horizon of being able to re be able to make these medical devices out of bioprinted uh, out of bioprinters, but in the short term, getting some of these uh, physiologically relevant models and, and high throughput for drug discovery purposes, I think is going to have a lot of value um, in the short term. Wonderful. Uh, well, I'm, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I think this was a, this was a great way to to kick off um, ISS R and D conference virtual version. So I hope everybody has a great rest of the day, and um, and look out for this recording uh, if you want to watch it again uh, in a couple weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everyone.